Most gracious heavenly God, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. Have you ever had a bad day? <laughs> and it rolled into a bad week? Or even a whole bad year? If, if, I'm going to go with pretty much everybody in here has seen heartache and difficulty in their life. Amen? I know y'all are Methodist. You can still say amen. <laughs> amen. We, we have all had brokenness and heartache in our life and difficulty, and, and it is hard. And so I want to recognize that there is that brokenness in the world. <clears throat> But it reminds me that what my preaching professor told me about preaching. He, he said, your job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable all at once. <laughs> comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable all at once. Uh, my, my job here today is I really want to comfort the afflicted, but if you get shot in the middle of it, well, it's okay. You know, and if I get shot, then, then so be it as well. There is this thing where we need to recognize that in the brokenness of the world, it is there. Uh, John Wesley said something interesting about preaching that I really enjoy. Uh, he said, you should be able to at any moment, if you're a Methodist preacher, preach, pray, or die. You should be ready all the time to preach, pray, or die. Two of those sound easier to me. So I'm going to circle back to preaching. And so I thought, uh, as I heard this, I better have a sermon in my back pocket. You know, you should just have one ready to go all the time. Well, guess what? Today is that day. So if you ever see this sermon again, you'll go, that's his throwdown sermon. And, and I wanted to give you the outline of that sermon. The outline of that sermon is also the outline of what I would consider Scripture. Uh, the whole outline of what Scripture is, there is good news, there is bad news, there is great news. Y'all need the outline of the Bible again? There is good news, there is bad news, there is great news. So the good news is, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and it was good. And He created fish and everything that crawls, and it was Good, you guys know this. And he created humans and it was, it was actually very good. He said, wow, this is very good. And then before we get too much further into scripture, we mess it up. Uh, we decide that we should be God. Uh, what was offered in the garden was to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. To eat of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. So in that, we could become our own kind of independent moral agents. We could make all of our own decisions, and we would no longer need God. So God took chaos and created order, and we decided to grab, uh, we decided to grab uh, being in charge, and what did we create? Chaos. chaos. You guys know right where this is going. This is good. So... Out of chaos, the, the whole of the universe is fallen. Not, not just us, but the universe also was caught up in this whole cataclysmic battle that is taking place. And so sin was introduced into the world and brokenness is out. And so I want to tell you something about bad days. Sandra Richter says this about bad days. We should not be surprised when things go wrong. We should be surprised when things go right. Since we live in a broken and sinful world, we should be surprised when things go well. So I think we, we are all too used to living in an exceptional place at an exceptional time. We have had it good. But if you look at all of human history, it is the story of brokenness and war and pestilence and not eating. and That's the story. But, but thanks be to God... He is rescuing us. Uh, Sandra Richter went on to say, not only should we be surprised by what good takes place, uh, she said the story of the whole Bible is the story of a rescue plan. 
It, it uses this metaphor that I think is a great metaphor, that there was this mountain climber, and he's climbing, and he gets higher and higher, and then he takes a misstep, and he falls, and he's at the bottom of a cliff, and he is broken and bleeding and uh, broken bones and lying there. And, and this is kind of the story of us. And so what has to happen then is rescuers have to come and approach him, and then they have to bandage the wounds, and they have to be able to uh, immobilize the broken, and then they put a, uh, what are those cage things they put underneath? I know, gurney? No, it's not a gurney, but there's a basket for getting you, y'all all watch TV. It's a what? A skid? Okay, they get the skid and they tape him down on that bad boy. And then you got to carry him out because he's too close to the cliff. And finally the helicopter arrives and they, they, they take him off to the emergency room and then they stabilize. And then the surgeons show up. So you have to have surgery. Then after the surgery, there's a rehabilitation time. And then you got to go to the physical therapist. Right? Have I missed anything? And then maybe wholeness. The difficult part for us these days is, is then finally when you get home, you get a bill. <laughs> but we live in that same story. The, the story of the Bible is there was this great fall. And then God, knowing that we would mess it up, and God knew what the, what the restoration plan would be. God knew the rescue plan that he would have to come still, still created us. Think about that. Even though God knew what the cost would be, God allowed us to mess up. And then is in the place of rescuing us. So the rescue plan, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, and, and then you go on through the covenants, and then it comes to finally, you guys know who is the big rescuer, it's Jesus Christ. So Christ came so that we might know what it is to be rescued. And in that, Christ comes because we need a rescue. Yeah, there's, there's a question I, 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 I'm reluctant to ask, but I'm going to ask it. I think people all too often think that they've been good enough to receive salvation. In the back of our head, we think, I've been good enough. I, I've got a news flash for you. I don't think so. I, I think that none of us have been good enough. In Romans, it says, who has fallen short? All. All. So we don't like to recognize that we are in need of saving. We don't want to recognize that we are in need of help. There's a really funny movie uh, that will really show my age. Uh, it's Monty Python and the Holy Grail. We're not showing the clip this morning, but I'm going to talk about it. So there's this great clip where uh, they're going after the grail, and, and so you have the knight show up, and then there's the black knight that's guarding the bridge. And they have to do battle. You're already laughing in the back. You know where the scene's going, right? And so he pulls his sword out, and they go, okay, Sir Knight, and he, like, lops the guy's arm off. And it's so badly done that it's funny, uh, the graphics of it. And he's like, well, your arm is off. I should go. And he goes, no, it's just a flesh wound. It's like, no, your arm's off, buddy. Then he cuts the other arm off, both legs, and he's sitting there on the ground with no legs, no arms, and he goes, have at you. He's still not giving up. I'll bite you at the knees. <laughs> now, why is that scene funny? It's kind of gross, but the reason it's funny is because that's who we are. <laughs> no, no matter how broken and messed up we are, we don't want to say, I need help. We don't want to recognize that we are in need of a rescue, in need of a salvation plan. Yet God has come to give it to us anyway. So we're going to pick up with the scripture. Bonnie, you did a wonderful job today with it. Uh, I was about to let y'all go early and go, I wrote a sermon, but Bonnie did so good. But I did write it. <laughs> God, I forgot y'all had that. <laughs> that is pretty funny. So you have these two characters, the Pharisee and uh, the Pharisee and the 
the tax collector, God bless the poor tax collector, the way tax collection took place back then is they were given an amount they had to collect. So if you had a territory, this is how much you have to collect. And once you collect that, the way you earn enough money to live is you collect over that amount. So there is built-in graft and corruption into the whole system. And so this poor man knows that he goes to work every day. I've got to pay this bill. And once I pay the bill to uh, my higher-ups, then I get to keep some, but he gets to see the suffering. So in the midst of that, I think he's really kind of broken by it. And, and then we have on the other side the, the Pharisee, who is awfully proud of himself. Awfully proud of himself. In fact, Self-righteousness comes to mind, which is a great word for what it is, because we can never be self-righteous. We do not reach righteousness alone. And so if we try to create self-righteousness, out of that is all kinds of brokenness. We have to tell, uh, and this is the initial lie that has to be told. It's the big one. It's, it's the sin that initiates all the other sin, is that I can be God, and by being God, then I can save myself. You, you see what the problem is? And so once you swallow that first one, the next one you have to tell is, how do you make yourself a God? Well, you've got to look around you and find where you can rank yourself among other people. So you look around and go, well, I'm better than that guy, a lot better than that guy. You, you see the trap? We, we, we look around and then we begin this, this comparison game. And out of the comparison game, he finds somebody that he is better than. And then we can feel self-righteous. It is a trap that is around us all the time. But instead, we're, we're asked to break that trap. We're asked to go, I am a sinner in need of salvation. That brokenness that rolls out of us is constantly looking for the person who's worse than ourselves so we can compare. Now, now here's, the, here's the problem is that the measurement of righteousness is not other people. The measurement of righteousness is God's righteousness. Did y'all get that? The, the measure of righteousness is not what all of us pull off. It's what God has in the way of righteousness. So the only way that we can have it is the gift what God gives us. It is God's grace. And so righteousness can never be from ourselves. It is imparted to us from God because we are a people in need of a rescue. <clears throat> so that leads me to two stories, and then I'll see if I can wrap this together. Um, two stories that have to do with the need for, for a rescue. When uh, Deb and I, uh, Alex was really little, and we, uh, my job in Dallas evaporated. Ever had one, a job evaporate on you? And my new job appeared in Houston. But we owned a house in Dallas. So I was commuting every, um, every Sunday evening and then going home on Friday. And in the meantime, I was packing my car full of stuff and driving a load of stuff every week to my parents' house who lived in Conroe. And they were gracious enough to let me stay again with them. You know, it's kind of once you've got a job, your parents are much better with you staying. <laughs> Just occurred to me. So, and this is the day before cell phones. Kids, listen up. This is a moment that you may not have ever related to. But there were no cell phones. There was no ability to call anybody. And I'm driving from Dallas to Houston. And all of a sudden, my dashboard lit up like a Christmas tree. All the lights came on. And I was like, I don't think the car's running. I turned off the radio. Car isn't running. I mean, it just... Now, the great thing about being between Dallas and Houston is there's some stretches of road where nobody lives. And guess where my car broke? In the middle, literally it should have had a sign, middle of nowhere, here you are. Uh, and so, you know, I kind of knew the area well. I'd driven enough times. It was 20 miles to the, the, the place behind me that was the last city, and about 15 to 17 miles to the next city. And I was thinking, if I were a marathon runner, which I'm not, this is a six-hour run. It's 8 o'clock at night on a Sunday night. I have no cell phone because we didn't, we didn't even know they were coming. So I'm sitting there with, and I'm looking around for a farmhouse. You know, there's got to be a farmhouse. Nope. 
So in that moment, I thought, you know what I need? I need a ride. <laughs> so I turned on my hazards. I stood out by the car, and I stuck my thumb out. Uh, and very shortly after that, a sleepy 18-wheeler, you know, a driver who was in need of somebody keeping him away, pulled over. I loaded up, and we rode to Conroe. I, I got there about 11 o'clock at night. And then I got out, and I jogged the mile and a half to my dad's house and got home about midnight. You remember this, Deb? You're right over there. Because she's at home going, where is he? So I call, uh, I'm here, honey, but the car's not. It'll be okay. But I could not, could not save myself. I needed a ride. You, you know, when you've, when you've been so used to everything that we have in the modern world today, we are used to, uh, in the Western world, self-reliance and rugged individualism, and we forget that when we get on foot, it's something else. Uh, one, one other story about this, when we were living in Kingwood, Hurricane Ike came through. And it came through in, uh, it just came up again the other day, and it was about the time we got a cold front here, and it reminded me, so it came through, it knocked out the power in key, all of Houston. We're all in the dark. Um, now, the wisdom of the people who were turning the power on was we lived in Kingwood, which is the far east side of town, and they started in Katy on the far west side of town. So it took them... It's a little over two weeks to turn the power back on at our house. And they didn't have power anywhere in Kingwood. It was a long time till it finally got there. Now, we were fortunate enough to have a, a car, and it was full of gas. And I also had an extra car battery and a little inverter, you know, a little, and a little 13-inch TV. This was in the day when you could put little rabbit ears up. I'm looking at the kids, they have no idea what I'm talking about here. <laughs> Rabbit ears. And so every night for entertainment, we would turn on the little TV for, a, for about an hour and watch that it, we had a hurricane, it was on the news. We'd watch that for a while. And our other favorite thing to do during this period of time was everything was thawing out in our freezer. We ate everything. Our neighborhood had cookouts. I began to meet all kinds of people, so we'd roll our grill out there, and we'd have bacon sandwiches, and then you name it, whatever was, what are we having tonight? And I go, what thawed out? But you know, after about two weeks, the freezer's empty, there's no milk, there's no bread, there were no 18-wheelers delivering to the grocery store, and I was looking at my wife, and the really nice news was, after a hurricane, we had a cold front. So it was cold, it was just wonderful weather for about two weeks. And then Houston weather returned with no air conditioning and the windows open, 95 degrees and 80% humidity. Great sleeping weather. No. And, and, and the thought occurred to me how dependent we are on each other that we are not independent, that we rely on each other, and that we need each other. And when the power came back on, we were grateful. But in those moments, come to realize just how much power we don't have. The good news is, the great news is, is that God does have the power. He does have the power to redeem us. If we would but just look and understand our, our passage today from 2 Timothy, Paul has lived his life. He has given all he could give. And he realizes that his salvation is not from his works, but it is because of what it is. It is a crown of righteousness for those who long for Christ. If, if you have difficulty in your life, if you have brokenness, if you long for Christ, then you are part of the people who know your dependence on God. And that is a good thing, for it is Christ who redeems us. And he says, I know that my hope will not be disappointed. For God will not put me to shame. Because he is rescuing us. My, my prayer for you and for me is, may we fully live into the moments of understanding that it is God that does the rescuing. And then may we have charity for one another. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.